Welcome to Virtual Face to Face with Dr. Bruce Gerald. I'm Alex Lukowski, Executive Director of Media Relations. Let me take you back to April 16th, 2016, in the words of then UNB President Jay Perman. This day, he said, is a celebration of deep love and affection that we have for one another and this very special community we share. At that moment, Dr. Perman, West Baltimore residents, and an array of civic leaders were gathered to cut the ribbon on the university's first community engagement center at the edge of the biopark on West Baltimore Street. It was a dream that was a long time coming, hastened by the unrest a year earlier following the death of Freddie Gray. Among those gathered, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings probably had the longest connection to the community, having served as a member of the Poppleton Board 35 years earlier. For nearly all of that time, the relationship between the university and its neighbors to the West, he said, was not very good. And those were very generous words, actually. Many felt the university turned its back on West Baltimore and feared any expansion across MLK Boulevard. But the congressman went on to talk about how much it had changed recently and how great an impact he hoped the CEC and its programs and resources would have on residents striving to achieve their dreams. There will be children for whom the trajectory of their destinies has already been changed by what you're doing here today, he said. Now, since that day, the modest 3,000-square-foot community engagement center has been jam-packed with programs, services, and people of all ages. After-school activities for kids, mentoring for young scholars, health screenings, career development and legal services, a computer lab, fresh food market, monthly community meals, Zumba, the ever-popular, and I do mean popular, line dancing with Billy and Peaches, and a whole lot more during more than 40,000 community visits since the CEC opened. Now, looking back, something Michael Seip, the head of the Southwest Partnership, said seems remarkably prescient. On that ribbon-cutting morning in 2016, he talked about the need to quadruple the size of the CEC. Well, we've done a lot more than that. At 20,000 square feet, the new CEC is seven times the original size. With a $4 million grant from the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development and support from the governor and the legislature and, of course, our neighbors, UMB was able to purchase the historic building at 16 South Poppleton, a community fixture since 1917, beautiful building, and transform it into something wonderful. It's bright, open, airy, and welcoming. UMB Foundation board member and Baltimore icon Ray Lewis said it best at the CEC's groundbreaking ceremony last October, imagine we're at the beginning of something great. Well, it is great. The building has been lovingly restored with an exercise and dance studio, a large multi-purpose room for community meals and events, a play area for kids, a wellness suite, computer lab, the list goes on. Oh, and by the way, those facilities and services that will occupy them didn't just spring out of the heads of university leadership. Every part of the greater community has been involved and had a say. Everything at the CEC is part of a shared vision. It's what Poppleton resident Cassandra Fair told us at the groundbreaking. Everybody seems to be really involved in this project. That's what's so exciting about it. Well, the new CEC, with all of its enormous potential to serve and unite the community, is ready and waiting. As Councilman John Bullock said, a brighter day is really dawning here in West Baltimore. So joining Dr. Gerald today are Ashley Vallis, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement here at UMB. Tyrone Roper, Director of the Community Engagement Center, and Ulysses Archie Jr., co-founder of Baltimore Gift Economy, a community nonprofit that, among other things, operates our discount fresh food market. Welcome to you all. Before I go any further, uh, I do need to tell the audience that this program is being recorded and will be posted on our webpage, umaryland.edu. And I want to urge you to get involved in the conversation. Look for the chat button. It looks like a speech bubble at the bottom of your screen. Use that to let me know when you have a question or comment. When Dr. Gerald takes questions a little later, just listen for your name. I'll unmute your mic. All you have to do is speak up. With all that out of the way, here's our host, UMB President, Dr. Bruce Gerald. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I had the pleasure of touring our community engagement center, and it is a spectacular new building. And I just want you all to know we're extremely proud of it uh, and also extremely looking forward to the time when we can actually do more in-person activities there, because, of course, right now we're sort of constrained that way, aren't we? Uh, but it's a beautiful building, and, and I just want you to know that you're invited to come over and, and see this great place and, and participate in the programs as well. So 
It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to have our three panelists. Thank you for being here. I think I'd like to start with Ashley. Uh, and and uh, Ashley, could you tell us what was the original idea behind the CEC and, and just a little bit about the programs that are there? Sure, can, can you hear me? Yep. Great. So um, when we were originally coming up with how do we broaden our relationship and deepen our relationship with our closest neighbors west of MLK, um, we looked at what other universities were doing and we talked to the community um, themselves, of course, about what they'd like to see from UMB. And at the time we were forming our ideas, the Southwest Partnership, which is a nonprofit of seven neighborhoods and five anchor institutions all surrounding our campus, were gathering community members to form, to form what became the Southwest Partnership, a nonprofit that's focused on community development. And so it was a gift to us that at the time we're thinking about deepening our um, engagement with our neighbors, the neighbors were forming themselves um, and really outlining a vision of what they wanted to see, not only from UMB, but from the medical center, from Bon Secours at the time. And so they, they were able to give us a, a, a vision document. We want um, more uh, economic opportunity. So how do we work at, at UMB? So we live across the street and it's not always clear to us how we apply for jobs there, for example. Where do we go? What door do we open? You know, who do we call? And so we have our Workforce Wednesday program at the Community Engagement Center, where now we answer all of those questions and help people apply for jobs. They also really um, told us that they wanted a safe place for children to be after school. Um, the rec center in, in the immediate neighborhood was only open after dinner. And so there was a gap from the time students got out of school until about five o'clock, where there literally was no after school activities at the time, no sports, no safe place for children. And so we um, we started um, our PAL program and now that's going really, really well. And we, we formed a better relationship with the rec center um, for that matter. And so we're really gearing up these programs now, but um, you know, health and wellness was also mentioned to us. So there's not a grocery store within walking distance of these communities. You'll hear from Ulysses a little bit later. That's something that he we were able to partner with him right out of the gate, and he was bringing organic food from Mom's Organic Market um, and Whole Foods and all of these great expensive grocery stores in the county and other places, other neighborhoods, directly to our neighbors um, for very very reduced um, cost. So. We heard these things. We we found partners like Ulysses. Um, we wrote grants like our PAL program, and um, those are some of the things that we have. You know, I think Alex um, loves to talk to Billy and Peaches. They're our line dancing instructors. Um, so they grew up in West Baltimore. Their kids went to James McHenry Elementary School 25 years ago, and they've been teaching line dancing at the Community Engagement Center um, since we opened. So we have a, an array of services. All of those things we hope to continue. Um, and I'll let Tyrone in a little bit talk about some of the other things now that we have a larger, more beautiful, welcoming space where we can do multiple programs at once. Um, you know, what else we have planned? The final thing I'll, I'll quickly say is the computer lab. So sometimes we offer, we just are a little mini office depot or um, you need to send a fax or you need to make a copy for your child's school or the teacher or the doctors. Um, there's not really a place if you don't have the capability at home to do those things to walk to in the community. So folks will come pop in and use our telephone, use our printer, use our computer um, and get just kind of what they need to get done for their families complete. So. Um, you know, there's individual services like that and, and then the programs that I also outlined earlier. Uh, but why don't you tell us what you do and tell me what your one or two favorite programs are right now. Tyrone, I think that was uh, directed at you. 
Um, so, so we're doing a lot. I think probably the best way to respond to the question, um, and, and if you're okay with this, Ashley, I'd like to talk about or have you talk about what we're doing currently um, in the current climate. Um, sure. Doing. And then from there, I can double back and talk about um, the excitement I have. I don't think there's a single <laughs> program I might prefer over the other. I think we provide a number of provisions, but I think that's probably the best way to really um, kind of begin this particular conversation. Sure. So, um, you know, we we were going in one direction and then COVID happened and we had, like everyone else, quickly uh, pivoted. And so thanks to our work, but also the Community Recovery Task Force for UMB has put in a tremendous amount of time and effort. That's led by Brian Sturdivan and, and Jane Schaub and numerous of our colleagues have been working um, very, very hard to say. Now that COVID is here and we're living in this different world, what does the community need that's different or that is more urgent? Um, and how can UMB meet that need? And so two of the things um, that we are doing that are that are proving to be successful, one is internet access. So bridging the digital divide was quite clear um, that students could not do online learning um, you know, at home very well or at all. Multiple children in a household, spotty internet, even if they did have a hotspot. So um, thanks to Peter Murray and his team and really all the leadership who approved this um, at, at the top, but now we're able to offer internet. We have over 600 families from 10 different Baltimore City schools that we are providing Comcast internet into their homes, um, getting them all hooked up as we speak, and we'll be able to do up to a thousand. And so that is just amazing that these um, children and their families and the moms and dads who who need it for work as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're working on that. We're also working with a smaller nonprofit called Project Waves, and they're putting their antennas on buildings and getting internet signal out to, to people um, who might not have a child in city schools, um, but need internet just, just the same. The second thing we're doing is, is vaccines. You know, as you've probably talked about on other face-to-faces, um, people are not coming in to see their doctor as frequently. And this um, is, was, you know, mentioned to us by both principals and the pediatric department. Um, here at, at UMB and UMMC, and so how can we still make sure that students, even though they're not going into school, which was a trigger for how you would catch students out of compliance for the vaccines that they needed, um, how do we still make sure that they're not, even though they're not going in the building, they're getting their their shots? And so last week we offered a clinic at the at Penn Street on campus, which is much easier for families. The only place you could go before UMB did this was all the way over on the east side of the city, um, very small hours. It was like Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to two. And so families were having, from West Baltimore, were having a lot of trouble getting over to that clinic or to their, um, in for their, their child's doctor. So we have two more, um, two upcoming Saturday vaccination clinics that we're offering with a focus on West Baltimore. UMB again is sponsoring this activity, the medical center. Um, is providing the space and helping us with the logistics. But there were there were hundreds, if not thousands, of students that needed this from West Baltimore when we worked with city schools. And so we're very hopeful. We're going door to door this week. Um, the community school coordinators at all of the schools that we're targeting are going door to door for families just to make sure that they know that they have this on a weekend that is much closer to their home. And so we're hopeful that that will um, serve a lot more families. So um, Tyrone has been giving away diapers. He's been, you know, giving away food and bread and care packages to the elderly, but all of that, you know, shifted, but it was what we needed to be doing. The work of Promise Heights, I'll just, I can't not mention that. They're doing all of the things um, that I just mentioned and then some. So really, if you think about from North Avenue, if you had a map in front of us all the way down to where the stadiums are um, and as far west as about Fulton and Monroe, all of those neighborhoods um, between Promise Heights and, and the Community Engagement Center were really targeting and focusing and, and beyond um, in terms of vaccines. But we, 
it feels like um, we're really addressing what we're hearing from the community, um, but there's always more to be done. I know the medical center has been giving out masks for people that need them, and that's a huge need. Obviously, Ulysses mentioned that earlier when we were talking before the program started. So, uh, all of that being said, um, where are we going? Well, we don't know when exactly, um, but. You know, the programs that I mentioned responding to COVID and then um, some new things, particularly in our health suite, we're thinking about and other things Tyrone's um, got in the planning stages in terms of our older adults. So um, I'll stop there and you can add on or we can take a different question. Tyrone, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, what, what you'd like to see happen. Um... So, so a little bit about myself is um, I'm an urban boy. I'm not a native of Maryland. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, grew up in Park Hill. I've been here in Maryland now for, for 22 years. So, I mean, all my work's been here in the city, work for city schools, work for behavioral health system, Baltimore, um, the mayor's office, um, and now uh, the sensational University of Maryland, Baltimore. <laughs> so, um, so we're doing a lot. I mean, we're doing a lot. One of the other things that um, we're also doing dur during the pandemic is we're doing wellness check calls, um, reaching out to neighbors, um, checking on them, seeing what what needs they have, um, what what how so public can support them. Um, so within the center, uh, we're, we're building up staff. We have to. Uh, we're moving into a much larger facility. Um, Ashley spoke about the vision plan, the Southwest partnerships, those seven collective communities um, built out. I mean, what they provided were really kind of what I call themes. Um, so you talk about economic uh, benefits and development. Uh, you talk about wellness. Um, so those are common themes, that, and this is how I view it. Um, and it's our charge to work on building out the granular components of those things. Uh, so we'll, be, we'll start doing our virtual kind of um, conversations with our neighbors, um, just to get a little more granular information around what they would like to be to happen with their community engagement center. Um, I like to say that, that we're simply um, hired servants to make sure that we're hearing from our neighbors about what they want in the building, um, to ensure that it's a safe place, um, that there is a, a lot of didactic experience for folks. Um, folks are walking out feeling full. Um, and we're super excited about the partnership with United Way of Central Maryland. Um, they're bringing some, some great resources and expertise um, to the community engagement center as well. So. I'm excited. Um, we, we have Danielle Harris on board. She's uh, the associate director of the community engagement center. And I have to tell you, she's my right hand. And we work, uh, we work in tandem, uh, really working to build out uh, like a full plan for how we will move forward with the community engagement center. Terrific, Tyrone. Thank you for that. And I certainly want to give Mr. Ulysses Archie some time to talk. You've been with the community engagement since the beginning. Uh, you've now formed this group called the Baltimore Gift Economy. Why don't you tell people a little bit about what your interests are and what is this Baltimore Gift Economy? Well, our focus when we started was uh, just to um, start with providing the best food that we can to the community. Um, and uh, so uh, I was there at the Community Engagement Center um, Speaking with um, speaking with uh, Ashley Dallas, and uh, uh, she said, "Hey, would you be willing to bring that here?" And I, I said, "Yes." And so the Baltimore Gift Economy is a group of people that kind of believe in giving and receiving, and that they're both synonymous uh, with with building community. Um, and so we started, and we brought our market in. Uh, it was outdoors at first. And uh, we would provide um, food from all of these markets, uh, Whole Foods, Roots Market, all these organic markets would uh, share their food with us to bring food into a food desert and to provide that and to give that to the community as a gift. And so our focus mainly was on food um, access and or what we were as we came to the the the, um, the community engagement center, we said, "Well, everybody is value. Everybody has value, but you can't necessarily see everyone's value because when we see a person, sometimes we're looking at their situation, or we're looking at what's going on with them, and um, at that very moment, and we can't see beyond that. And so, what we wanted to do is address the needs of people." 
uh, and then have a conversation uh, with them. And we would start out every customer that comes to our table, we would ask them this one uh, signature question. What do you like to do for fun? And so um, the, the that would then start a conversation with uh, building a community and um, finding out what makes them tick and what, what their interests are uh, so that we could serve them better. And so the community, Community Engagement Center really provided them, they provided tables, they provided lights, tents, spaces for us to be. I mean, uh, air condition, uh, just amazing, um, just amazing uh, work. It, it's just been, it's just, it's just been great. I'm on my phone, so I'm coming in and out. I'm not sure if you guys can see me or not, but sometimes it comes in and all. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, so uh, the Community Engagement Center embraced me. And when we started, it was like, it was like for three months and we ended up being there for three years. So, so that's what we've been doing there at the Community Engagement Center. And we um, it also spun off other programs as well. So let me uh, kick it back to you guys though. So that I won't be talking forever. Ulysses, we can hear you well, and that's a spectacular story. For those in the audience, please make sure you send in Alex questions because we want to move to audience questions here in a minute. Uh, Ulysses, one thing I didn't hear from you is uh, how do you manage to collect all this food and other gifts? Well, we have agreements with um, these various different um, organizations, uh, and we go every week. Uh, to pick up food. And we develop relationships with the managers and uh, the people that are in the stores and they um, they look for us every week. And it's it's like family. And um, so we're, we're grateful. We travel as far as Clarksville um, and um, to pick up food and to offer it as a gift. And what I mean by offering it as a gift, um, if you know a little bit about our history, just to tell you a little bit about our history is when we first started um, doing what we call food rescue, um, we would get food that was really spent. It wasn't really, you know, we had to sift through it and make it, you know, good. Uh, and we decided we didn't want to do that. We wanted to get the very best that we can. And so through agreements, um, they pulled stuff off of the shelves when it gets close to um, uh, the you know expiration date that they can't sell it, um, and sometimes they give us a week or even two weeks on some of the items that they give us, and um, that way we can share it as a real gift to people, and they can utilize it and um, and for themselves and for a new um, you know just just for themselves so that they can really get a benefit from it, and so um, that. That's uh, how we started. We started on a parking lot. Uh, actually, we started at a school. Um, but yeah, we and so we've been doing this for for a while. Uh, and so, yeah. Terrific. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience again, questions, we're looking for questions. Uh, Tyrone, what surprised you about the Baltimore community, about its, its resilience, about uh, the power of people uh, during this pandemic? What, what surprised you? Uh, unity. I got to tell you, there's, there's such a great appreciation uh, for your respective zip code, uh, for your respective block. Um, there are some super, super neighbors that we work with. Uh, Ms. Sonia, Ms. Paulette, Ms. Rennell, uh, Lynn Roy, one of the neighbors. I have to tell you, we have some really awesome neighbors. And I'm always, you know, I'm always uh, taken back at how there's such a level of appreciation uh, for their community. So for me, it's really become super incumbent upon me to make sure that, that, that I'm helping to support them in sustaining and beautifying their community. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's one of the things that really surprised me. And I just wanted to share real quick. One of the things that Ulysses didn't um, echo is uh, the Baltimore gift economy is not just about uh, fruits and vegetables. They they provide quality meats. Uh, there there's you know, and I've heard that from neighbors. Neighbors have told me, Tyrone, we just don't want vegetables and fruit. Um, I can't make a stew with vegetables and fruit. Uh, he provides quality meats for people, um, and it's exciting. So um, I didn't I didn't want him to um, miss that big point. Uh, because it's it's for neighbors, and I hope that folks continue to um, utilize it once we're back in full operation. Uh, the one thing I did want to share is, is before we start, um, we're we're in a very prime 
place right now to hear from our neighbors. And because of the current climate, we really can't structure focus groups one on one. Um, so I encourage people to email um, email us at ubengagement at gmail with any suggestions, concerns, needs that you may have. We check this email account daily and we respond to those that, that submit any type of inquiries. Um, or if you're interested in receiving our weekly newsletter, feel free, email us at umbengagement at gmail.com. Right, thank you. Well, what's been hardest for you in terms of your transition to this online job? What, what have you wanted to do and you just can't get done right? It's been a lot that's been difficult. Um, running around with the mask on is difficult. I'm trying to have a full conversation with people uh, while 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 trying to work through the mask and just getting um, acclimated with that. Um, I, I love conversations, right? I really like to talk to people in the community. Um, so it's a little it's a little different now. Um, while I always use safety and how I engage and have conversations, um, others are are a little more leery around engaging. So 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 to engage is not as easy as it used to be. Um, so, so we're working on a, a mode to really better communicate with our neighbors um, in a more safe way. Um, even if that means um, um, getting a tripod with an iPad, um, sitting it on the corner and having conversations with people. Um, I want to make sure, and I'm very, I'm serious about that. I, I really yeah. want to make sure that we're hearing from people um, around what their needs are. It's crazy what we've come to, isn't it? You would have never guessed you were going to be doing that. Yeah, it's a new time. Um, one of the other things I miss is um, just just the kids running around. Uh, right. Really seeing their faces. We've had a few opportunities where I've seen some faces. I do um, I move about the community, so I'm, I'm oftentimes I'm able to have conversations with young people. Um, but it's just different. I, I think it's just different not having the energy in house, um, not hearing the screaming and yelling, and then saying, "Hey, can you be quiet?" Um, now I'm now I'm like I'm tired of this quietness, right? Yeah. I'm screaming. So yeah. uh, some things like that I miss. Thank you. So Alex tells me we got a couple of questions, but please keep your questions coming in. Alex? Yes, we have uh, Marie Moen. Are you uh, are you with us? She's got a, 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 actually several questions and comments. Hi, thank you. Thank you for hosting this presentation. Um, it's great to meet all of you virtually. <laughs> um, and it's just so exciting to see how the Community Engagement Center has grown. Really huge congratulations to you, Ashley. Welcome, Tyrone. And, and great to hear about your um, uh, endeavors, Archie. Just remarkable. Um, I think you answered my questions. I really wanted to know how the participation has been since you've transitioned to online during the COVID. Um, I, so I'm going to switch my question from the, from what I said in the comments to, I am, I am feeling that and you've all touched on it, kind of the resounding fear, um, that might be, um, a, among community members about engaging publicly in anything and having a background, um, in HIV myself and recognizing the stigma that can go along with that. Have you, um, thought about um, how to address, you know, what, what are realistic fears and how to, how to message what will be a safe mode of engagement to encourage people to come back? And are you worried about kind of permanent melt due to fears of, of re-engaging in person with uh, C, C, um, Community Engagement Center activities? What do you think, your lessons? Well, um, what happened with us is we had to pause um, when the community engagement center closed. We were like, wow, um, you know, we have to figure out what's going on with this COVID and, and it wasn't really communicated very well from the national standpoint. And then um, we said, OK, how can we do this in a socially distanced, responsible way? And so um, as we started to talk about it amongst ourselves and uh, we decided that we would continue. Uh, so we started to go back to get the food and, and put the food into a park called the Peace Park uh, that we would then post it online and then folks would come uh, to the table and it would be uh, a gift to the community. Uh, and then as uh, as we were developing and people were seeing that we were doing very well with that that effort, they um, asked us to join in partnership. Um, I'm thinking of like this one partnership with Pearlstone. Um, and so what we do now is we 
um, give away 200 um, plus uh, quarts of soup to local community members um, every week. So we get 100 on Tuesday and then we get 100 on Thursday. And just as we were speaking, some of my uh, some of my distributors were coming through <laughs> and uh, grabbing soup. Uh, and so what we do is we will we'll have the soup here where where some of the people will come and receive it. And um, what we have also been doing is for those people that are homebound uh, and a lot of our customers are homebound and we check in on them. It, it's a very unusual situation. We actually check on our customers when they don't show up. We check on them, and so what we do is we um, we deliver to those people that are homebound and can't um, come out, and we have delivery as far as um, as Hartford County uh, to be because um, wow. they used to live here in Baltimore City in this area, and they moved, and so uh, a lot of their um, their resources and everything were in this area. Uh, and so we did not want to, you know, uh, disconnect from them. And so we go all the way out to Harford County twice a week to deliver soup um, to those folks out there. It's a phenomenal story. Impressive. Phenomenal story. Uh, Merrick, did you have other questions? That's it for now. Thanks. That's it. Okay, Alex. All right, as always happens in these things, everyone is so busy. Dawn Rhodes uh, had a couple of, of, of questions, and one of hers has actually been echoed by some other people. Uh, they want to know how people can be involved in the Community Engagement Center. But let me, let me ask her other question, because uh, I think that's an important thing uh, looking ahead. She said that the uh, CEC has traditionally partnered with uh, another organization and hosted a holiday store for West Baltimore neighborhoods to purchase mm. Christmas oh, wow. gifts. Are people thinking about, it's not too early to think about that, are thinking about how that service and things like that can be delivered differently this year? Alex or, or Tyrone or, or Ashley? So the Christmas store, Don, um, that's an excellent point. Um, I don't know, I am currently on maternity leave, but I am gonna send them an email if they hit Tyrone, if you haven't talked to them. Um, we really do need to to huddle because, you know, that's in person. And so it we would have a line out the door every year and people would come in and shop. And so, you know, obviously we need to adjust the model. Now, what we did do in years past is we only let a certain number of people into the shop at one time. Um, but these are all things that, you know, we're just going to need to, to figure out and, you know, gift cards come to mind, but then all kinds of other rules and regulations. Um, if, I know, just, if I could just interject, Jill Hamilton has uh, jumped in with a note. She says, uh, she said, yes, staff Senate is working with Brian, Brian Sturdivant on this as well. So somebody's thinking about it. They're working on it. That's, that's good to hear. That's what I wanted to share. Actually, we are moving that, um, so so that's happening, and and the the actual practice practice itself will will be one where we simply build out um, those safety nets to ensure folks are safe. Um, much like what you said, uh, there will be a certain number of individuals that will kind of transition through, uh, but we have begun having that conversation. Yeah, that is a huge, um, pop, hugely popular program every year. Um, so we definitely, you know, don't want to let folks down on that. Back to, I just wanted to thank Marique and the School of Nursing because uh, something that I didn't mention that Marique is a part of, as well as um, everyone really from the community public health side of nursing, we get nursing students at the CC every year who help with some of our programs. And so as they're looking at community um, health, They've helped with everything from our PAL program um, to our first year, I had a group of nursing students who ran exercise classes for seniors. They ended up theming those exercise classes on the decades. And so they would come in costumes from 80s and 90s. And these seniors who would come to the CEC for, for, to work out in a chair with our nursing students dressed in costumes, playing the air guitar. It was hilarious and a wonderful, wonderful um, way to use our students 
and their energy um, to get you know better health outcomes for our older adults. And so, Marie, thank you for always um, sending us some amazing nursing students every year um, through through their coursework. Hey, I want to. I want to. Oh, please, please. Please. Is, that, is that's okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the CDC provided. Um, uh, volunteers for us, uh, and that was wow, that was amazing. And we met um, so many people uh, that were working on their degrees and and different different things. And one of the people that we met was Dr. Lindetta Jones, uh, just amazing. And she came in as a volunteer, but I didn't know she was Dr. Lindetta yes, Jones. Is. I just I just met her as Dr. Jo as as uh, Lindetta actually. I didn't even know she was Dr. Jones. And, <laughs> and she said she would come back and um, work with us. And so partnerships have developed out of that. And um, so, yeah, the volunteers that will come through and that have also uh, helped us and now springboard us into more deeper relationships within the university. Uh, Cause now I'm a, I'm a, an, uh, I, I pace a uh, fellowship person, fellowship member um, there at the university, and it's it's been great. Uh, and so anyhow, I just wanted to say that the volunteer uh, opportunities really grow and blossom into so many other things. It's just amazing. Great. Thank you. Alex, do we have additional questions? Sure, we have plenty of questions coming in. Everly Brown is here. Everly, are you, uh, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Hi, Alex. Hi, go ahead. Hi. It's really exciting to hear about the amazing work you guys are doing. Um, I just had kind of a simple question. How aware is the West Baltimore community of the CEC? Do you think we've gotten the word out? I think we have to do a much better job at that. Um, uh, we work with a lot of communities. So, so while I can say we have a weekly newsletter that goes out, um, I think there's a major opportunity for us to do, to do better, um, to hold ourselves accountable, to make sure that folks know about the provisions we provide within the center. Um, so to answer your question, um, it's, it's, I don't have data behind this, um, but, but I would say that there's a major opportunity for us to do a much better job at doing outreach to our neighbors, making sure they know about the community engagement center. And we, you know, when we started, we would go door to door um, when we used this is another way we use students um, and volunteers. So we would go door to door with the newsletter. We would print the print, you know, our monthly calendar off um, and walk through the neighborhoods to make sure people knew who, that we were open. One of the stories that I always tell, though, is because we didn't have a physical presence in the neighborhood for so long, you know, we were really program base, we would go and operate programs at Baltimore City Schools that we would get grants for, but then the grant would end and then the people would go away. There was not a physical long-term presence from UMB in the community. We opened and it says free resources for community on the front of the building and people would kind of walk by and look in the window and at, come in sometimes if they felt comfortable and say, well, is this for me? like free resources for the community on the window still didn't appeal or, or make it clear that this is a community space for you and come on in. People still saw it as a university building, I think, and a university program. And so, um, as Tyra mentioned, we will, this will be something we will always have to work on. And it's more challenging now because we're not going door to door. Um, because, you know, you don't want to show up at people's doors during a pandemic unannounced. Um, and a lot of people aren't online, you know, quite as much. And so what is the best communication channel? I will say um, we used the Baltimore a Rabbers at one point. You know, they um, have the horse and, and carriage with produce and they would travel throughout West Baltimore giving away produce and bread that we were able to help them procure from H&S Bakery. Um, and so we would put health information and CEC information on the A-Rabbers course and cart, and they would hand it out. And, and that was just a way to get the word out about some other things and pretty unconventional. But when you think about it, a, a smart way during a pandemic um, to get the word out. But 
if anyone has suggestions on how we can can communicate broadly in West Baltimore, um, you know, during a pandemic, please, as Tyrone mentioned, email us, you know, call, give us a call um, if you found something that's working, um, because we don't want to hold back any resource. Um, and it's just a challenge right now. And so, so if I can, this will be the last thing. So I, I don't want to go on my talking rant. Um, so one of the other things we're looking at purchasing um, is SMS software. Uh, for individuals that opt in, we we would have the ability to send out mass text messages to a particular group, uh, making sure that they're aware of what available resources are. And there's sometimes where one of our neighbors or partners may have a benefit or a resource to one of the neighbors that we suddenly hear about. Um, that's an opportunity to send out a text blast uh, because the reality is not everyone is logging into their email, reading the weekly newsletter. I get it. Uh, so we have to be really innovative in how uh, we're communicating with our neighbors. Um, Dr. Joe, I have to, I, I would be remiss if I didn't answer your question around what is my favorite program. Uh, first of all, let me say it this way. We have an awesome team. We have a really awesome team. Um, so, so I don't have a favorite program. I'm in, I'm a huge supporter of all of the provisions that we provide um, from workforce Wednesday to power program, um, to the local merchants access program, um, tech program, our new stamp program. We have a lot of awesome provisions and programs that we provide within the city. I had to say that because I don't want my colleagues choking me out. Um, at so your team is your favorite. I got it. <laughs> got it. Uh, I think I would. I think I would have picked Ulysses's program. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! Alex, you got other questions? Well, we have a lot of other questions. Most people are having either mic problems or they're using the wrong computer. I will say that uh, our friend Lisa Rawlings. I uh, wanted to point two things out, the Facebook page, and, and uh, she wanted to mention that. And also, she wanted to remind you both, as I'm sure you know, that your favorite program is Workforce Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, Workforce so, Wednesday, right. <laughs> big program. Very important. Um, another uh, another uh, question from Al Essien. Al, are you, uh, are you on the line? I, I am. Go ahead. Um, you know, Tyrone and, and Ash, thanks so much for what you guys are doing in West Baltimore, just so, so grateful. You know, I saw your short video on the CEC partnership with Project Waves and to provide internet access to residents in West Baltimore. Has that project been able to expand to serve more residents, especially since I use uh, at home trying to learn with city schools? Yes, so um, one of our new team members, Barnard Smith, he was hired, um, to, to run our rec to tech program at James McHenry Rec Center. And as you know, Al, um, we're not getting into the rec right now. And so he is transitioned to really work on this bridging, bridging the digital divide um, program. And so he is working on the Comcast um, front and also working on getting these more antennas up on buildings in West Baltimore that can help get internet signal out to communities for free. He's worked with Bronwyn um, as well. So not just within the seven neighborhoods that make up the Southwest Partnership, but more um, in the Promise Heights communities as well. And one thing that, that we need with that is property owners who are willing to say, yes, you can, you can put an antenna. I have a, an apartment building, for example, in Sandtown. And I wouldn't mind if you put an antenna on, on my roof um, that could, you know, get internet out to more families. So um, that is a way that people can help and we have the infrastructure to do it, but a lot of the time it's just relationships and that's what Bronwyn um, has been working on in her area and we've been working on down here. So um, yes, we're, we're moving that forward, but you know, we need more, more connections quite frankly. Alex? Sorry, just taking care of some house uh, house cleaning business. We do have a comment from uh, our Facebook live feed from our own Miss Dottie, who I miss. Yeah. You know, you think about all the people you don't see that you, you, you miss that you'd like to see. And uh, she wants to know if there are programs that we're going to have for uh, young men and fathers. Great question, Miss Dottie. Way to put us all on the spot. <laughs> Miss Dottie, I will say, since the pandemic started, and before, she has kept up her exercise routine, walking all around her neighborhood, using our campus as a walking path, 
And so we all have to give Miss Dottie props because right. every time she does her walk through the community, she posts it on Facebook so we can all watch. Mm -hmm. um, Tyrone, yep. I will let you answer that question because I know it's something you're really excited about. Yeah, so so absolutely, Miss Dottie. Um, that is absolutely one of one of our intentions. Um, so so I will be working with um, some, some folks here at UMB, um, Kyle Locke, Roger, Roger Ward. Uh, we, we've already started to have some early conversations around developing a male mentoring program. Um, so that's something we'll be building out. I'd um, love to have you come partner and join us as we build this out. Um, again, the, the way I look at this work, it's as a social worker, I, I fully understand like the ecological perspective of folks and, and how folks are impacted. Um, it's important that we touch folks at every point in their life as best as possible. Um, and, and do it in a way where we're offering it, right? Not, not from the seats of privilege that we sit in, um, but really hearing from folks around what they need. So I've heard this from the community. I've heard that young men um, um, need some type of mentoring program um, that's very specific. Danielle and I just had an exchange yesterday and I said, wouldn't it be awesome if we had the ability to create a program that's specifically focused on young girls, um, teaching critical thinking skills, um, basic etiquette, um, things like that, and in turn have, have the same for men. Um, so do know we're we're working on that. Um, we, we're absolutely working on it. Um, it's just it's going to take a lot of support and help to build this stuff out. But do know it will happen. Uh, yes. So we have a, a similar question to the uh, to the uh, Christmas uh, uh, event. What about Thanksgiving? That's coming up. Soon. Is there any mm -hmm. thought to collecting food and are we going to be able to do something, whether it's if it's not an event like we've had in the past? Is it something more like, you know, enlisting the help of the A-Rabbers to deliver food? Is that is that? A yeah. Thought? So Brian Sturdivan, again, these these drives, these collections, he always is our point of contact for those things. And what we've done in the past for Thanksgiving is we've made sure um, our Cure Scholars, then their families, all have, um, you know, baskets and turkeys. And um, as you can imagine, storing and giving away turkeys can be a logistical nightmare. Um, but we figured that out in the past. Um, and then we've given all of our PAL children also, um, you know, all of the Thanksgiving foods that, that you would need for a meal. So I will let um, the staff and faculty Senate um, we can send that out and, and if there is gonna be a donation drive, you know, the trouble is usually folks will be familiar seeing a big bin at the elevator in their building. And so they come in and they put the canned goods in the, in the bin and Brian collects everything and then we sort it and get it out to family. So without as many people going onto campus to be able to donate the food, um, we just need to figure out again, logistically a, a different way um, in the COVID time, but people still need it just like, you know, they've needed it in, in years past. So Alex, I don't know if we share things um, after face-to-face -face somehow, but we can definitely get it out um, through faculty and staff Senate, as well as our CEC newsletter. Ulysses, do you have any advantages in the holidays in terms of, of getting food? Well, uh, during the holidays, that's when we actually take our break because we're doing it all, all year long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we do it every week. Uh, and at one point we were doing it three times a week. So yeah, and, and I, when we go to get food, we don't know uh, what we're gonna have from week to week. So it's, it's kind of like a surprise. Uh, we show up and they give us uh, that. But I can say that I can, um, you know, offline speak to Ashley and the crew and see if uh, some of the groups are interested in, um, in, in, in supporting. Gotcha. Alex? Yes, Patricia Fanning is, uh, is having a little trouble logging in with her iPad, but she wants to know about the Cure Scholars and what what's going on with them. Are they able to, uh, I think I know the answer, but you can tell the answer. Uh, are they able to do their work uh, from home? Are they coming to the site? Are they going to be able to come to the new site? Is everything going to have to wait until we're fully open some months from now? What's, what's going on with our beloved Cure Scholars? So, 
Tyrone, um, I don't know if you've talked to Gia more recently than I have, but yes, they all have Chromebooks. They are actively engaged in the Cure Scholars programming after school. Um, you know, it's hard, just like our PAL program, now that our students are online all day, getting students to log back online for an after school program is just more challenging across the this, this city and I'm sure in, in other cities as well. Um, but, you know, we're all doing our best to make it fun and interactive and shorter, but still offer the service. Um, when, when the pandemic is over, um, the Cure Scholars have a beautiful space in the new building. Um, we made sure that they have three different classrooms that they can use after school and on Saturdays. Um, one is more of a science lab type setup and there's a big fume hood if I'm using the right terms, but if they're doing experiments and they needed to store things or have a different exhaust, um, all of that was built into the new CEC. So our Cure Scholars um, definitely were top of mind when we were thinking, well, the third floor could be donated or, or dedicated to them um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, which is their programming days. But then our PAL program and, and other programs can go into those same classrooms and, and use them on different days. So that's what I mean when now we have so much more flexible space. But yes, our, our scholars have dedicated space now, which they didn't have before the new building. And what we're hoping is that it meshes the programs even more together. So now that Cure Scholars are coming to the CEC three days a week when this is when it's safe to do so, their parents are picking them up there and they might take an exercise class or when their parents or siblings come and get them at the CEC, um, you know, they connect with the United Way two on one worker if they have a need. And so hopefully um, by co-locating the programs, you know, we actually um, work better and, and more closely together. Tyrone, I don't know if you had anything else to no, you're, you're spot on. Okay, Alex. Well, Dana Rampola has a comment. Dana, if you're with us, she's probably uh, gonna tell you a lot of the things that people tell you about how they feel about and how they're impacted by the CEC. Uh, Dana, are you there? Hi, I'm here, everybody. Um, this is really just more of a comment, but I know I've said it to a couple of people across the university. I am just always amazed at the fabulous contributions and connections the university shares to not only the CEC, but the overarching Office of Community Engagement. It makes me incredibly proud to work at a university who partners with the community in this way, providing provisions and growth opportunities, resources, just offering the community members an opportunity to change their tra trajectory. I, I, when I first started here, I, I, I didn't even realize that universities do this sort of thing. And I think that what makes UMB special, is it's not just a little niche of, of products, resources, or services that the CEC offers, but it's just the connections to the schools and community education and access to things like the census and voting opportunities right there in the community. Um, gosh, everything that PAL does, the, the wellness support, the social work, the legal clinics, it, it's, like, it's amazing to me when you think about all of this coming from truly a small group of people. And I don't know, I, I share with my friends all the time, I just kind of brag about you guys and say that you're not just providing fish, you're teaching the community how to fish. So I just want to say thank you for all you do. I think it's kind of, you know, a, an unspoken opportunity that you get to get up and do such meaningful work while it's tremendously laborious and time consuming and heartfelt. Um, it's also just awesome what you do. So I just wanted to say thank you. I'm so proud to to be able to brag about you. Dana, you are so kind. But it it your point, um, you know, you and Alex and, and the whole team at communication supports us and, and helps us get the word out for the work, which we're appreciative of. And really, I think what's what's really cool and interesting about the, the work that we do is it gives a lot of other units at the university a way to participate with us in this work. And so when we have Workforce Wednesday, it's not just Lisa Rawlings sitting there, it's Lisa with HR 
you know, colleagues. And so from the time we started that program, HR, um, you know, but even before Matt Lasecki was, was there, was sending over our colleagues from HR to sit once a week and help people find jobs, mock interview them, how do you navigate the UMB website? And so there's many different um, ways that our colleagues on campus can help support the work in the community. And I think that's what really makes the model unique. So thank you all for supporting us and thanks to all of our partners on campus. See there, Tyrone and Ulysses, a lot of people appreciate you on campus and in the community. We certainly appreciate them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Alex, we have time for maybe another question. Well, uh, Jill Hamilton and, and Sarah Hokenmeyer have flipped a coin and decided actually that Sarah uh, is going to come forward and tell us about some of the collection drives going on. Sarah, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, this is so exciting for me to hear people asking questions about these drives and wanting to learn more about the CEC. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Tyrone. Hi, Ulysses. This is very exciting to hear. Um, the staff Senate works really closely with Brian Sturdivant every year to run these drives. And of course, things are different this year. But um, in anticipation of sort of a different way of collecting, we have already created three donation links, one for each one of those projects. And I think Alex has already posted the school supply drive link here for everyone to see. So you can go there. We're collecting donations now through October 9th for school supplies. Ryan's helping us work with our community partners and also with Cure Scholars and the PALS program to get those supplies out to the students. You could donate now to the Thanksgiving project and the holiday project as well. And we're, we'll be working on those logistical details for how we can get things to people. So thank you all for your interest in that. It's very exciting to hear. Okay. Alex, anything else? I think we've we've come to the uh, to the end of the questions. You've answered a lot of questions. You list us any uh, last minute uh, requests or appeals or uh, uh, comments? Uh, well, I like to uh, partner with the CDC and um, and serve in the neighborhood and, and perhaps uh, getting soups to people that are locally there. Uh, maybe being a drop off center or something like that. I'd like to talk to you guys about that. Um, we'll be increasing our output to 300 soups, three and a quart soups next week. Next couple of weeks, I think. Uh, so um, we like, we'd love for you guys to um, to assist in some way and get back on on track with uh, touching the community again. Right, Alex. That sounds like a challenge, Tyrone. <laughs> no, I'm always up for it. Good. Any other comments, Tyrone? Um, none. I just appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I told the team yesterday. You know, it's a, it's an awesome opportunity for us to be able to. Um, uplift the work that we do. Um, you know, we, we really do function in the mode of service. I uh, make sure we're, we're meeting the needs of our neighbors. Um, but at the same time, it's good. It's good for the team to know um, that the work is appreciated. Um, so I just want to celebrate the team for the work they do. And just encourage everyone to continue moving forward through the pandemic. Yeah, well, six months or a year from now, hopefully we'll be able to repeat this and we'll actually be on site in the CEC. Yeah, absolutely. Person. Ashley, any last comments? As Tyrone thanked the team, I, I have to thank the leadership just because, you know, as Alex mentioned, Alex mentioned, Dr. Perman kind of really embraced this um, during his presidency as something that had, he had always wanted to see us do more and better in the community. And so we we took that on um, and, and you've been supportive um, ever since you kind of were interim and now and now permanent. And so um from dawn support with the new building and jennifer um roger all of the leadership i think really has bought in um to the vision and we we couldn't do it without that support so i just want the broader campus to know that that you know that's where our resources come from that's where the support for for you know the things i mentioned with covid the internet all of those things are because you all um made that happen so um, thank you very much for that. Well, community engagement has become one of our prime missions. I think 10 years ago, it was not so much that way. Today, I think it is that way. I think it's here to stay. I certainly am committed to it, but much more important than that, we need to make sure that the institution 
uh, over time continues to make this one of its primary missions in Baltimore. So I want to thank our three panelists for being here today. Thank you for your time. Uh, Ulysses, I'm sorry we didn't get to see one of your chickens. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll but come back and show you the farm and everything. You know. I got you, yeah. And uh, I, I want to thank <laughs> all of you for participating. Uh, Alex, uh, thank you very much again. And I think that's the end of our session, huh? That's it. We're, we're okay. all done. If you have uh, questions, you know, you can check out the website for the CEC and and also, uh, Tyrone mentioned earlier, email them and get on that uh, uh, list. I sent everybody the uh, email address in the chat. So there's no reason not to be involved. Gotcha. Okay, thank you all very much. And, and uh, see you during these difficult times. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Bye.